Um, that's one thing we're going to look at and dive into this morning with uh, this Canaanite woman and Jesus. Um, and so we're continuing this response series of what does it look like when Jesus shows up? And what do we do? We've looked... Sorry, I'm back, there's a... Maybe if I go back here, we'll be okay. I think it's a little better. When Jesus shows up, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000 and what it means to give little. We looked at Peter walking on water and what does it look like to take that step of faith. We looked at Jesus' conversation uh, with the Pharisees and what does it look like to really just value the presence of Jesus over the sake of our own tradition and ways of doing things. Last week, we ate Oreos. I will tell you there's no food involved in this sermon, but that's okay. Look at this week is what does it mean for in the presence of Christ for the unworthy to be made worthy? You heard Anita read on the scripture passage, and, and for a long time it was one that, that very much confused me. I kind of shied away from. I really didn't know what to make of Jesus' words, and that he only came for the house of Israel. I mean, it's effectively what seems on the surface of he's calling this Canaanite woman a dog. But what we're going to look at through this is the very words of Jesus. He's... he's telling people he is the Messiah and what it really looks like for us to have worth as, and to be unified through one body. So go ahead and open uh, with me to Matthew chapter 15. Um, I'll be reading out of the ESV version this morning. Um, all of our liturgists ask me what version of the Bible I'm going to be using and my answer is always, I don't know. It depends on the week. <laughs> Um, part of that is, if you are aware that there are many different translations and versions of Scripture, um, and it all kind of boils down to what the, the translators uh, want or how they would like their Scripture to read. Uh, some are more concerned in preserving word-to-word -word translation, um, and so that is what the ESV is. Other versions um, are more concerned with portraying the meaning of the sentence as a whole. And so, with some passages, I think it's easier to understand if we just read the meaning. Uh, but for this passage, specifically this morning, um, I felt that it was easier to understand um, if we took a version like the ESV that focuses on each kind of word individually to preserve that. Um, and so that is why, you may wonder why it seems like I use a lot of different translations. Uh, that is, I think, uh, try and find the one that, that easily communicates it um, to you and we can most effectively teach out of. So as we get started with this passage in Matthew chapter 15, um, Jesus has been traveling, traveling around. He's been with the Pharisees, um, but at this point, he now kind of moves into enemy territory uh, for lack of a better phrase there, that Jesus and the disciples are entering Gentile land. And so we're told that Jesus went away um, and he withdraws to the district of Tyre and Sidon. These are two kind of kingdoms or land areas um, within the broader country of Phoenicia. Um, it's a land area that, that stretches across modern day Syria, uh, Lebanon, and, and into parts of Israel. Um, and so kind of at this time you have Israel Phoenicia um, and then Syrian Phoenicia and so Jesus actually enters into what it would be known as modern day Syria and so in this light of we've had Jews responding to Jesus kind of in their own territory we've been in Israel so we've been preaching the message of the hope of Israel to the Israelite people we're flipping that today of now we're going to talk about the hope of Israel to the non-Israelite people. Um, which is if you ever see the word Gentile written uh, in scripture, it simply means not an Israelite. Um, it's the easiest way. So we're talking about the, quote, unbelievers territory this morning. Secondly, we get this introduction to the Canaanite woman. 
Now, and behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. This is the only time that Canaan, the word Canaanite, um, to describe a person is used in the entire New Testament. Um, it is used one time, and it is that sentence or verse right there. These details are very small. But to understand the rest of this passage, they are, they are very important. Um, if you are familiar with the land of Canaan, it was the promised land um, that the Israelites were headed to and eventually began to dwell in. To explain it to you very simply, the Canaanites and Israel were enemies at war with each other. And yet what we see is we get this one hint at a Canaanite woman, and she makes this extremely traditional Jewish confession. Right, calls Jesus, O Lord, right, O Yahweh, O God of Israel, Son of David. Uh, we would know that the, the Messiah um, of Israel would come through the lineage of David. The Canaanite woman essentially shows up and says, Jesus, I believe you're the Messiah. Right, and asks for healing for her daughter. Right, we get other accounts in the Gospels of Jesus healing demons and exercising uh, demons out of people. And I find it very interesting that we have this Canaanite woman um, in light of all these passages of what seems like the Israel people not recognizing the Savior of Israel. And we get this Canaanite woman that just shows up and could have gone to a lot of other sources to try and have this demon exercised, but she shows up at the feet of Jesus and faith that he really is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. And how do the disciples respond? I feel like so much of this series has kind of been dragging the disciples through the mud a little bit, um, and their failure to, to not recognize Jesus before everybody else, and their failure outside of Peter to, to not step out of the boat Last week we looked at that wonderful question of when they come to Jesus and they're like, don't you understand, you just really offended the Pharisees by that. And yet here we also have these disciples who they see the woman and basically tell Jesus, can you just like make her leave? Right, they write, but he, so Jesus does not answer the woman and his disciples came and begged him, right, saying, send her away for she is crying out after us. One question as, as I was really thinking about this verse is, is what do we do when people worship differently than us? Because that's really what was going on here. Right? The, the disciples were Israelite men and now we have a Canaanite woman, their enemy, worshiping the same God. What happens when our enemies worship Jesus? What happens when someone comes to Jesus in a way that is unfamiliar to us? Or something that we have not experienced? What happens when a fellow believer worships in a way that we don't find comfortable? Or we've never seen that before? We drag the disciples through the mud for, for being annoyed and saying, like, can you just get her away? She's, she's kind of bugging us right now. But I think some of us, if we're honest, these are kind of our thoughts every single day. Right? We have those people that we see them walk in the door and we find the closest door to walk out the other side. Right? If I just don't have to deal with this person, if I just don't have to be in worship with this believer, we can both worship the same God, but we're going to be in different places. Right, what happens when your enemies worship alongside of you? That is the question the disciples must answer. All that background information gives us so much. Right, and it really sets the stage for what Jesus is about to say to this Canaanite woman. Because it was always the, the Israeli mosaic kind of way of worship that we get. Right? That's why these conversations between Jesus and the Pharisees were so kind of revolutionary and, and flipped everything on top of their head. 
was because the Mosaic law had a certain way of worship. It was the Israelites and it was everybody else. And what we're going to see today is Jesus kind of erases the line in the sand and says, no, it's one united body in Christ. Right, they're in Gentile land. Jesus is speaking to a Gentile woman who makes a Jewish confession and all the Jewish men are mad about it. And so we get to this conversation that Jesus has with the Canaanite woman. Right, and interestingly enough, when she asks Jesus, right, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter's oppressed by a demon, and Jesus says, nothing. Doesn't answer her even a word. We don't know how long that silence was. Long enough for the disciples to interject. But when he does answer her, Right? He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we as Gentile people, as non-Israelites, I think we start to question what this verse really means. Was Jesus sent for us? Or was he really only sent for Israel? And what we see, and, and this is... This is probably one of the, the, the verse that kind of troubled me the most. Of just what do we make of the full church and what do we make of Jesus coming as the shepherd for the house of Israel? Like what do we do with this as non-Israelite people? Jesus makes this statement one, there's two reasons. And we're going to go through both of them. The first one is Jesus is actually fulfilling prophecy by saying this. By saying he was come to send for the house of Israel, he is making messianic claims to the house of, like, that he is the shepherd of Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 50, right, God writes, my people have been lost sheep. Lost sheep need a shepherd. Ezekiel chapter 34, right, that God says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. We read it and we go, well, David would be the shepherd, right? The only problem is the book of Ezekiel is written like 500 years after David was king of Israel. And so if we know the messianic king is going to come through the lineage of David, what we're talking about really here is that the shepherd is going to be from the house of David, and essentially they're the house of Israel. And so when this woman shows up and says... O oh Lord, son of David. And Jesus responds and says, I was sent for the house of Israel. We're starting to see these ties of really, she believes Jesus is the Messiah, and he is confirming that he is the Messiah. But the prophet Micah writes, he shall stand and shepherd his flock. This is, who would the Messiah king be? Uh, he will be a shepherd and, and leads his flock in the strength of the Lord. This is all wrapped up right, in the, one of seven of the I Am statements of Jesus where he says, I am the good shepherd, right, in John chapter 10. In what seems like, well, what do we do about this? We actually can find hope that Jesus says he was sent for the house of Israel. Because by saying that, he's really confirming to us, to the Canaanite woman, to his disciples, that he is the good shepherd that will lead his flock back to the Lord. He is fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy. Secondly, this statement shows that Jesus is extremely aware of God's plan for salvation. Right? We worship the God of Abraham... Therefore, we worship Yahweh, the God of Israel. The God that we find in the Old Testament that inspires and writes the New Testament through us. That is Jesus. To give you a quick 
summary of what story does the Bible tell. In one way, it tells the story of Jesus. But to make this a little more simple, I think, in, in the scope of the Bible as a whole, Genesis 1 and 2 tells us about creation. Genesis 3 tells us about the fall of man. Genesis 4 through Revelation 20 is the story of God's redemption. And Revelation 21 and 22 tell of the new heavens and the new earth that are coming. I say that to say 99% of the Bible is written about the redemption that God is bringing. It's talking about the coming of salvation. If you were here last week, it's God's plan about your little Oreo. So there is a plan. But what do we do of that? And if Jesus is the answer of salvation, where does he fit into this story? And this statement actually helps us kind of put those pieces together. This statement is troubling in a sense because when Jesus is sending his disciples, you see it there in Matthew chapter 10, he says, don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. So why would the disciples only go to the house of Israel? The whole way back in Genesis chapter 12, um, with the story of Abraham, right, God says to Abram, this is the first three verses, paraphrased, shortened, all that fun stuff. The story of, the summary of what God says to Abram um, is go, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This blessing that we are talking about is salvation. Right? That the people who have fallen away from the Lord can be redeemed back to the Lord. That is the blessing of what we are talking about here. I've often kind of called this passage the original Great Commission. We're very familiar with the Great Commission of Jesus to the disciples. But I think God gives Abraham the original Great Commission in telling him, it is through you, and we know that Israel comes through Abraham, that it is the descendants and the seed of Abraham that would be the ones to take the message of salvation to the non-Israelite people. If you get a lot of these, if we're talking about Israel, it's written in Deuteronomy that the Lord your God has chosen you to be, you, the Israelite people, to be a people for his treasured possession. They would be the ones to carry the salvation to the rest of the world. Right, John writes in John 4, this is the uh, encounter with the woman at the well. The Samaritan woman. Right, he says, for salvation is from the Jews. Um, and then goes on, Paul writes in Romans, um, this verse that you may be familiar with, the first part of it. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. We know that part. The second part of that verse is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There is a plan for redemption and it's going to come through Israel. That's why in the end we're going to have a new Jerusalem. Right? Jesus' ministry was in Israel. The whole point was that salvation was going to come through the house of Israel and they were the ones responsible to carry it out to the rest of the world. A lot of times I think we have problems with this, and especially as I was reading and thinking about what Paul writes here in Romans is that salvation will come if it is from the Jews and it's going to go to the Jew first and then the Greek. Like, why do we have so many problems with this verse? Like, why does this just not seem fair? Why do they get to have salvation first? Step back and realize they've got the, the sole responsibility of taking salvation to the people. Right, but secondly, I, we, we have this idea that if we're not first, we don't want it at all. Like, if I can't have salvation first, well, then I don't want it at all. If they're going to get to heaven before me, why should I even bother? And we start to see part of that. 
And the truth of the matter is, I think when we're all in heaven, we're not going to really care in what order we got there. We'll be happy to be there. But through this one statement about being sent only for the house of Israel, Jesus is making his claims and fulfilling his claims to be the Messiah and also to show all of them that he is God and he is fully aware of what the plan for salvation is. And in response, this woman acknowledges Jesus as king. Personally, I think it, it, it's great and it tells us a lot that the disciples' response is not mentioned at all. We're told that they're annoyed and want the woman to go away and then like that's the last part we hear of the disciples in this statement. Right, very much like with Peter, when we're told Peter steps out of the boat, and oftentimes we forget that he was in the boat with all the other disciples. And so as Peter's walking on water, there's 11 other disciples just standing in a boat. I think that's what we get here. There's a Canaanite woman who basically says, you're not an Israelite. I came for the house of Israel. And she goes, that's fine, Lord help me. We get her response of worship that she comes and kneels before Jesus, acknowledges him as the king, and what about the twelve disciples that are probably standing in the corner? Right, she comes, and for all these, it's a lot of, the next part, Jesus is, te is a test of faith, really. In the first part, when Jesus doesn't answer her, not even a word. Right? What happens when God doesn't respond to our faith? Right? We make all these claims, we pray all these prayers, and what happens when God is silent? To give you a, a very sneak preview, it's what we'll be talking about in two weeks. Right, uh, in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is this period called the intertestamental period. It's 400 years of God's silence. That's longer than the United States has been a free country. That's how long God was silent. Right, so when he's silent, what do we do? And when he responds, what do we do? That's the whole point of this series. But I think it's also a test in... This woman is essentially going to take on all of the things that she hears of why she is unworthy. She's not an Israelite. And Jesus answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. This is communication of just how Jewish people think of Gentiles. Right, this term dogs was given to pagan Gentile people on the sole basis that well we're the Israelites, we've got the blessing and you have about as good of a chance as a dog of going to heaven. Like your chances of receiving salvation are from the Lord because you're not of the house of Israel is slim. I think this comment would have perked the ears of the disciples. Of kind of like, yeah, send her away. Like, Go Jesus. Not understanding like what he is saying is really about to flip everything that Jewish culture believes. It's going to flip it all on its head. Because it really comes from a place of humility. This woman being told that she's not from the house of Israel... That it's not right to throw bread to the dogs. Continues kneeling in front of Jesus. Calls him Lord. And says, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Even the dogs still get something to eat. Jesus, you're right. I'm not an Israelite. My faith is that of a dog at times, yet we still get to receive. But what do we do when Jesus doesn't respond? Somehow, like, Jesus doesn't answer this woman a word, and yet every time she speaks, her faith becomes just bolder, more courageous, more vocalized. 
Like it moves her into a deeper place of worship. And the funny thing is about this passage, in what seems so offensive, that you are not an Israelite, that you are a dog, the woman never argues with Jesus. She never argues about what Jesus is essentially responding to her. Why? Because it's not really about her. Right? Go back to the beginning of this passage. Her goal in being there is really for her daughter to be healed. And she is willing to take the place of even a dog if it means that her daughter is healed and receives blessing. Right? For those of you who are parents, you will humble yourselves for your kids to be okay. You would take the lowest of the lowest positions for your kids to be okay. That's what this woman is doing. And she's willing to humble herself to even the level of a dog because just the crumbs of Jesus is good enough. And there's more power in just the crumbs of Jesus than what we could ever do with our own human hands. All for her daughter to be healed, she's willing to humble herself in order to receive blessing. All right, so what do we do? What do we take from this? How do we respond? And sometimes it's physical movement. It's an emotional state. Sometimes it's just encouragement. And I hope I give you a little bit of all of that. If we want to be like the disciples, or not be like the disciples in this case, and I would encourage you to be aware rather than annoyed. Because what we see is that this woman says, I have a need, and the disciples basically look at her and go, you're annoying, leave. Right? We would rather send people away than serve them at times. And I think it's because the disciples have gone through everything. They just experienced the feeding of the 5,000. Peter almost drowns in the storm. There's this clash between Jesus and the Pharisees. Yet there's still a single individual woman that has a need and needs to be served. And I don't think the disciples are fully aware of that. Hence, their response. Right, 2 Timothy chapter 4, right, we're encouraged to preach the word. Right, but be ready in season and out of season. We have to be ready at all times to preach the word, to share the gospel, and to give witness and testimony to why we believe what we believe. Right? Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready whether you feel it or not. If we want to do it or not, there's somebody around you that needs the gospel. That needs served through the power of Christ. And a lot of times, we're just too annoyed and too inconvenienced to do anything about it. All because she's a Canaanite woman. We're on opposite sides of the fence. What Jesus establishes here and what we're going to see and what we believe now is that the church is the body of believers from every tribe and every tongue. Every single one. By Matthew 24, Jesus tells the disciples, the gospel of this kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world. It will be the testimony of nations. At right, the beginning of the Great Commission, Jesus tells the disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. In this moment, the disciples don't want to serve this woman because she's a Canaanite woman, not understanding their primary task of once they know the power of Jesus is to take it to the nations. And the nations include your neighbor. The church the full body of every tribe and every tongue. If we understood that, we would understand that encompasses everybody is called to be part of the church. And so we must be aware and be ready to share the good news that has come from the house of Israel. This is the hard one. <laughs> Submit yourselves. To what? Right, we talk a lot about submit, surrender. Submit yourselves to the Lordship of God. 
Right? It's this woman that is on her knees, bowing before Jesus, says, Lord, help me. Right, he responds, I've come for the house of Israel. It's not right to throw the children's bread to the dogs. She comes back with, yeah, but even the dogs can eat the crumbs. Oh, woman, great is your faith. One thing, uh, you'll hear me say it a hundred times when we get to Easter. We know of the cross of Jesus. And sometimes I think we forget that Jesus had a crown. All right, we are called to worship, I think, both the cross and the crown of Jesus. What do I mean by that? We proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not just Savior. That if we're going to be saved by Jesus, we have to submit ourselves to the Lordship of God. Right? That is what great faith is. It is making yourselves the least of these to receive what is the greatest of him. The Greek word for when Jesus says, O woman, great is your faith, right? It's this term called megas. I've looked at where else is it used to really, what does it mean to have great faith? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, but whoever does them, talking about the commandments, and teaches them will be called great. Right? So great faith is in keeping the commandments and teaching them to other people. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, whoever would be great among you, great faith is to make yourself the servant. Right? In Luke chapter 9, for whoever least among you, whoever humbles themselves to be the least of you, is the one who has great faith. Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes about the mindset of Christ. If Christ is the greatest, he made himself the least. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This woman becomes a dog for her daughter. And what Paul tells us in Philippians is that God became man, taking the form of a servant. He became a dog of creation for you. So that the sons and daughters of God may be healed. And may be free. This whole thing, in one point, the person of the table is more important than your position at the table. This woman's comment in response to Jesus is, is so good. It's so clever. But it's so true. Right? When Jesus says... Right, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she responds, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Even the dogs have a position at the table. Even the dogs are welcome to eat of the table. And I love that she says the crumbs of... This, this, this whole thing is about the crumbs that fall off the table. The crumbs of the bread are still the same bread. And I think this would really come across to the Israelite men and the disciples standing in the room. That it might not be the full bread. And she might be a dog, the least, most unworthy person in this room, and yet she's still eating of the same bread. That is why the church is a united body that comes through the one body of Christ. It's all the same bread. And the person that is standing at the table in Jesus is more important than whether you are at the head of the table, you are at the side of the table, you have a seat at the table, or you're in the corner, or you're a dog under the table. Right? In Acts, the God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears Him and does what is right and is acceptable to Him. There is no more Jew, there is no more Gentile, there's no slave nor master, no male nor female, we are all one through the body that is the bread of Christ. Right, the whole point of this in John chapter 10. Right, Jesus writes, this is very shortly after he says, I am the good shepherd. And he says, I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Why? So there will be one flock under 
one shepherd. All right, in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes us, right? He says, for the love of Christ controls us. But we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. That is what we talked about last week. And it is the sin of Adam that has condemned all of us before God. And he died, Jesus, that all those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, for their sake. He died and was raised. I don't know where you find yourself at the table. Whether you feel like you want to sit at the head of the table, if you're lucky enough just to have a seat at the table, if you feel like you're worthy of a seat at the table, or more importantly, if you feel like you're a dog. Right? Your faith has been that of a dog. You are about as worthy as a dog to receive salvation from the Lord. Because chances are, and the truth of the matter is, we are all of that. We all deserve to be under the table and get scraps. But this conversation shows us that because one man died for us and spilt his body as the bread, that whether you've got the whole loaf or just a crumb of the bread of Jesus, that is what makes you worthy before the eyes of God. Right? The person of the table is more important than where you find yourself at the table. It's the same bread. That is why salvation is available to all who repent and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and he has been raised from the dead. There is a seat at the table for you. But you're told that there is a mansion with many rooms awaiting us in heaven. Right? And that Jesus has a room for you. There is a seat at the table with your name on it. And it is not the seat of a dog of unworthy. It is the seat that makes you a co-heir with Christ, worthy in the eyes of God, forgiven of your sin, and saved into eternity to be with God. That is what we get from this Canaanite woman. We're not Israelite people, but we still proclaim faith in the Savior of Israel, because the Savior of Israel is the Savior of the world. Pray with me this morning. God, we are extremely unworthy. There's not really a part of us that is worthy before you. We are the dogs under the table. And as much as we don't oftentimes want to admit that, that my prayer is that your spirit just reveals the sin in our lives, our sinful nature, and God, how much we really need Jesus. That like this woman, we would just kneel before you no matter how much we're told we're unworthy, how screwed up we are, how far we've gone from you, whatever the past looks like, God, all that matters to this woman and to us is that we kneel before you and say, Lord, help me. God, in that through your message, when Scripture steps on our toes, it seems insulting. Really, through all of it, it is the story of you being the Messiah and the Savior of the world. That even the lowest of the lows, the worthy, the most unworthy, are able to eat at the table with Christ. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken on the cross, your blood that was shed on behalf of us. And now you sit at the right hand of God interceding on our behalf. God, may this morning we humble ourselves before you. May we kneel before you and just say, yes, Lord. We eat of your bread. We receive your salvation. We humble ourselves before you, and that is what makes us great. God, in these moments where we feel so unworthy, Satan attacks us with everything that wants to make us unworthy. God, we rest in the truth of your word, your cross, your redemption, the empty tomb that says even the most unworthy 
is worthy of a seat at your table. God, it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.